Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Suzanne Barbour. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School here at UNC Chapel Hill. And I wanna thank you for choosing to spend your time this afternoon in this very important and timely discussion about the inter interplay between universities and democracies. On behalf of the Graduate School's Royster Society of Fellows, the Institute for Art and Humanities, the Program for Public Discourse, the Carolina Seminar in Higher Education Working Group, and the Democracy in Initiative within Carolina Next, I, I wanna welcome you all to Chapel Hill by way of the power of the internet. Our public university is, the, is at the forefront of how North Carolinians and beyond shape knowledge, drive innovation and research, and engage in the marketplace of ideas. This is all done by way of service to our state and our graduate students are absolutely foundational to that work. And that's why our Worcester Society, Society of Fellows led by Worcester Distinguished Professor Tori Ekstrand at the Husband School of Journalism and Media values conversation like the one that will, will unfold this afternoon. I would like to thank Tori for prompting this important discussion. And I'd also like to take this time to thank Laura Pratt for her out, outstanding leadership in organizing this event and Rachel Underhill for making our technology work. It's my pleasure to introduce to you this afternoon, Kevin Guskowitz, who serves as the university as its 12th chancellor. Chancellor Guskowitz is also Keenan Distinguished Professor of Exercise and Sports Sciences, and he's co-director of the Matthew Feller Sports Related Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center, and he's a nationally recognized expert in concussions. Thus, our Chancellor Guskowitz is a neuroscientist, a concussion researcher, and an academic leader, and it's his vision that has spawned Carolina Next Innovations for Public Good, which is the, role mark, the, the roadmap rather for our university's strategic priorities. Among the strategic, strategic initiatives in Carolina Next is Promote Democracy, which is very much germane to our conversation this afternoon. The Promote Democracy initiative is designed to inspire a culture of listening and respect and civil discussion for advancing democratic values and effectiveness in our community. There are three objectives within the initiative and they aim to engage diverse citizens who are responsible for the institution of American democracy, to work across our differences by promoting respect and uh, for and listening to each other, and to explore how humanity's highest purposes can be achieved through democracy. These objectives codify our chancellor's view of how this proudly public university can provide what it owes to the citizens of our state and through them to our nation and indeed to democracy itself. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our chancellor, Kevin Guskowitz. Thank you, Dean Barbour, for that uh, generous introduction. And uh, I'm so glad to be here with all of you today as we welcome Ron Daniels, uh, the president of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, president Daniels has been at the helm of uh, Johns Hopkins since 2009, a remarkably impressive tenure for any university leader. Uh, under his leadership, Johns Hopkins has enhanced its commitment to student access and financial aid, uh, deepened interdisciplinary ties across the university, and focused on social and economic innovation in Johns Hopkins' hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. President Daniels leads one of the finest private universities in America, a 150-year-old institution that has shaped the history of this country. Like Carolina, the oldest public university in the nation, Johns Hopkins was founded with an eye toward public service. Knowledge for the world, as the Johns Hopkins motto says, and an understanding of the role its graduates must play in upholding American ideals. Higher education and democracy have been closely linked since the earliest days of the American experiment. I often note that Carolina was chartered at the same time our state legislature was ratifying the US Constitution. The country was just 17 years old when the cornerstone of Old East was laid. History had never seen a sprawling, diverse republic on the scale of America. And the founders of our constitutional democracy put tremendous faith in the power of education to bind this country together. They knew that democracy was history's exception, not its rule, and they did not take for granted that self-government would thrive from one generation to the next. And neither do we. Government of the people by the people must be taught, celebrated, and defended. And that's why we have a democracy initiative and why it's part of Carolina's strategic plan. It's why we honor the people and the events in our history 
that have broadened democracy's reach, especially the Black Americans who fought to bring our public life closer to our shared ideals. President Daniels knows that history as well. He holds a Master of Laws from Yale University and received his JD and undergraduate degree from the University of Toronto. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. And he's a fierce believer in the responsibility of great American universities to strengthen America's greatest idea, democracy. In his latest book, What Universities Owe Democracy, Daniels takes a clear-eyed look at the challenges facing our democracy and examines the indispensable role that universities play in nurturing democratic values. President Daniels and I both grew up in an era when democracy seemed to be on the march, triumphant even, on the world stage. Today, the world looks very different and democracy looks more embattled than it has in decades. In the midst of a global pandemic, a renewed reckoning around racial justice and inequality and deep questions about how democracy and pluralism will thrive in an era of huge disruption, President Daniel's insight and conversations like this one are vital. I'm grateful to the Graduate School and its Royster Society of Fellows, to the Institute for the Arts and Humanities, the Program for Public Discourse, and to the Carolina Seminar Higher Education Working Group for their work in organizing this virtual visit and promoting such a vital discussion on our campus. It's an honor to now welcome President Daniels. Well, thank you so much for that really warm introduction, uh, Chancellor Guskowitz, and uh, for the invitation to speak with the UNC community about uh, my uh, book, What Universities Owe Democracy. I should say, uh, just uh, uh, um, as, as, a, as a starting point, you know, for me, coming to a great public institution uh, like UNC is a real privilege, and particularly because, as was described a moment ago, I am a student of public universities, having grown up in Toronto, having received my undergraduate degree, my law degree from the University of Toronto, having spent uh, several years as a faculty member, and then ultimately as a dean at the law school at University of Toronto, and so deeply grateful from having a great public education and, and truly appreciate the foundational role that uh, public universities play in the life of a uh, great democracy. So for all those reasons, it's really great to uh, be here uh, today. And um, as I said a few moments ago to Kevin, I'm really sorry that I couldn't be able to join you in person. As I confessed, I suffered an injury a couple of weeks ago while ice skating on a new pop-up uh, ice rink that that we established this year at Johns Hopkins uh, when I think I was elusively trying to uh, re-experience or remember my youth and moves that I one time was capable of making on an ice skating rink, but uh, ended um, with, um, with uh, a non-trivial injury that's uh, slowed me uh, down a bit. So, um, so for all those reasons, um, I'm sorry that I'm not able to be there in, uh, in person. Even though we're virtual though, as I said a moment ago, I'm truly honored to be here. Now, let me start by uh, a little bit of history. In 1790, just a year after UNC was chartered, George Washington delivered his first State of the Union address. He devoted a fifth of it to the importance of colleges and universities. Higher education, he argued, was necessary in his words to the security of a free constitution. Washington dreamed of a single national university that would unite all the parts of the nation. Now that never came to fruition. Instead, in the centuries that followed colleges and universities multiplied across the American landscape from liberal arts colleges to two-year community colleges to private research universities like Johns Hopkins to great public universities like this one that were built to be as famed CBS sports anchor and revered UNC Chapel Hill alum, Charles Carroll called them, universities of the people. Across this history, universities and democracy have been come deeply, even I would argue inextricably intertwined. Universities need democracy to thrive and flourish. 
But at the same time, our universities are indispensable institutions in their contributions to democratic governance. And yet, as we well know, democracy here in the United States and around the world is more fragile than I think any of us really understood. In the past decade, the Varieties of Democracy Institute has found that the share of world population living in democracies has dropped from 52% to 32%. Fueled by bigotry, polarization, anti-institutional sentiment, democracy has now retreated back to where it was before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this is no abstraction. On January 6, 2021, the fragility of democracy was brought terrifyingly close to home when more than 2,000 American citizens launched an attack on the US Capitol and threatened the peaceful transfer of power. In this moment, every core democratic institution has, I believe, an obligation to step up. And that clearly includes our institutions, colleges and universities. Now, in the book I wrote with uh, Phil Spector and Grant Shreve, What Universities Owe Democracy, I identify core four, four core ways that universities contribute to democracy. They advance social mobility by launching students up the socioeconomic ladder. They educate students in the values, history, skills and aspirations necessary for good, robust democratic citizenship. Third, they steward facts and cultivate expertise that can be used to inform the public and policymakers, and importantly, check power. And finally, they foster pluralism by bringing together from people from vastly different backgrounds and teaching them how to engage with one another meaningfully, constructively across their differences. Now, in recent years, I, like so many others, have begun to worry that our colleges and universities have not lived up to their full potential in discharging these roles to their fullest extent. And this is diminishing not only their ability to support democracy, but also the trust that the public places in us. That said, I believe that if we as institutions engage in a rigorous process of self-searching and reform, we can truly renew and fulfill our obligation to democracy, again, at a point in time where it is particularly urgent imperative that we do so. In the time that I have this afternoon, I'd like to walk through the four functions I've listed, identify areas where I believe colleges and universities have not fully discharged their prospective roles, and then to offer a few thoughts on what I believe we can do to restore these vital capacities. These are really just suggested. I'm sure there's other thoughts that you all have about other things that we can do in this domain, but I really want to be able just to set out some ideas that can start the conversation. So you'll recall the first role that I talked about um, in terms of the university's contribution to the strength of democracy, and that's social mobility. Liberal democracy, of course, is premised on in part on the notion that all people, regardless of the station of their birth, should have the opportunity to climb the social and economic ladder on the basis of their aptitudes, efforts, their ambitions. In the United States, we of course call this promise the American dream and our colleges and universities have long been among our society's most important institutions for making that dream a reality for millions of young people. In fact, I think we're probably society's most powerful institution for truly playing this role in, in, in casting people up out of their circumstances into greater levels of material comfort. An American with a bachelor's degree earns about twice as much on average as an American with only a high school diploma and is far more likely to avoid poverty and unemployment. And these are just the private benefits, as I talked about earlier today, that derive from having a university degree. Um, and there's, of course, a whole host of public benefits that are associated with having an informed citizenry. But just in terms of the narrow private benefits of increased earning power, decreased likelihood of unemployment, higher levels of life expectancy, less likelihood of uh, serious illness, 
all of those things are associated, those very palpable private benefits are associated with the receipt of a university degree. Yet as important as this commitment to equal opportunity is, we have of course not fully delivered on this uh, potential contribution. And this is true not only of institutions in the United States, but in truth, it's true of higher education throughout the world. In the United States, several years ago, Harvard economist Raj Chetty and colleagues released a study showing in stark numerical terms how effective colleges and universities were at recruiting low and middle income students and launching them up the socioeconomic ladder. While a handful of schools performed remarkably well on many of these measures, many more were undercutting their potential as engines of mobility by keeping students from less well-resourced backgrounds on the outside looking in. And indeed, a really damning statistic is the fact that there are nearly 40 top colleges and universities in America that were found to enroll more students from families in the top 1% of income earners than the bottom 60%. It's just a truly staggering statistic. Now, there are multiple reasons for this, of course, but I think there are two obvious uh, overarching uh, causes to look to. The first is the tragic retreat in the past 30 to 40 years of federal and state governments from their historic support of access and financial aid. And nowhere is this more evident than in the steady loss of value of Pell Grants, which used to cover nearly the entirety of college education and have served for so many students what author Tara Westover has described as their first taste, their first whiff of financial security. Yet Pell Grants now cover on average less than a third of the cost of attendance. But of course, colleges and universities shoulder some of the blame too. Indeed, they have tended to adopt or double down on emissions policies that have had the immediate effect of advantaging wealthy students and disadvantaging poor ones. And among the most pernicious are practices like demonstrated interest and legacy preferences that we know give an unfair advantage to more affluent students. Students who have had every possible advantage yet get another advantage at the time they apply to our institutions. So what can be done? First, I think it's imperative that we continue to advocate passionately for more federal and state support for access to higher education, seeing it as a fundamental investment in a world in which human capital is the coin of the realm, but also not just about the financial returns that comes from receipt of a university degree, but also understanding that the education, the habits, the, um, the uh, awareness of, uh, of our core foundations of our liberal democracy are really foundational to the democratic stability of our country. We also have to remember and insist upon the fact that higher education is, as I said before, not only a private good that assures graduates a more prosperous life, but a public good that holds, that knits our society together. At the same time, colleges and universities themselves, I think, have to make the very difficult decision to either abolish or, prof or profoundly reconsider emissions practices that we know unfairly and really without any foundation of principle, disadvantage low-income students. Now, several years ago, uh, we ended legacy preferences here at Johns Hopkins. We did this in about 2016. We made it uh, public in 2019. Although there were clearly loud objections from some quarters, the truth of the matter is the view of our alumni broadly was positive and encouraging. And uh, the decision had no discernible negative effect on our fundraising, which as you know, is often proffered as a key argument for why institutions have to continue these practices. So that's, that's social mobility. Let me turn to a second area where colleges and universities um, serve democracy and where I think we can, uh, we can think about an enhanced role for our institutions and that civic education. Now here, if one looks at the long-term trend lines of civic participation in this country, they do not look uh, terribly promising. From 1984 to 2014, the share of American adults 
who said that they didn't believe that staying informed about current affairs was an obligation of citizenship more than tripled from six to 20% of the population. At the same time, dissatisfaction with democracy among young people has risen substantially, particularly in our country. The problem seems especially acute among this generation of students, many of whom, of course, uh, this generation of citizens, many of course are also university students. But universities, I don't think will be doing enough to educate our students in democracy. We have been content to let K to 12 students bear that burden. We don't have that luxury any longer, especially when we know that only about 25% of American K to 12 students demonstrate an even rudimentary level of proficiency in civics. And meanwhile, almost 70% of high school graduates now go on immediately to enroll in post-secondary education each year. So we have these students coming to us that clearly have had a grotesquely deficient education in civics. Um, and the question is whether we are doing anything to remediate that. The idea that higher education ought to teach democratic citizenship it's hardly a new or bracing, uh, bracing one, but our colleges have delivered on this charge in truth and consistently over the centuries with moments of resurgence followed by periods of departure. Today, the model of civic education that has emerged on college, college campuses is primarily ones of community service or service learning. By many measures, the service learning movement as it's known has been incredibly successful. Yet by focusing so narrowly on community service, I worry that it has allowed universities and university leaders, and here I include myself, to skirt the question of whether our students are also receiving a foundational understanding of the duties and the responsibilities of democratic citizenship. And I believe that we as educators and leaders have an obligation to restore education for democracy as a core element of our institutional mission. At the center of any effort, I think should be some kind of democracy requirement. This could take the form of a course, extracurricular activities, uh, some kind of exam, or some combination of uh, each of these instruments. How each institution achieves this will need to be determined by its own history and the population it serves. But whatever specific form it takes, it seems that this education can be done in a manner that is neither reactionary nor radical, but even handed and comprehensive, and ultimately can be justified to constituents on all ends of the political spectrum. By this, I mean it should incorporate a rigorous study of the ways in which the democratic experiment has achieved its highest aspirations as the ways in which it has fallen short of its ideals of equality, liberty, and opportunity. And above all, it should provide students with the knowledge and the tools to renew democracy's promise. So next, let me talk about facts. And as we well know, facts are the lifeblood of democratic life. They are indispensable to public decision-making and debate. And colleges and universities have long been seen as preservers and discoverers of facts, as well as places where faculty pursue many lines of inquiry and publish insights that may run counter to the interest and claims of those in power. Yet we're now at risk of subverting that role through, I fear, our own neglect. Over the past two decades, we have seen real cracks emerge in the academic research enterprise. And chief among these is, of course, the reproducibility crisis. <coughs> study after study has demonstrated that an unsettling amount of research in the life sciences and social sciences cannot be replicated. And meanwhile, important areas of scientific inquiry like climate change have become so polarized as to resist sober evidence-based disagreement. And these trends, have not gone unnoticed by other governments or the public. They've imperiled the reliability of discovery as well as the public perception of academic work. Moreover, they have fueled partisan tax on universities, accusing us of being places driven more by ideology than a commitment to truth and fact. And the answer to this problem is not easy, but at least 
at least I believe one important step lies in bringing our knowledge closer to the people it is meant to serve. We can no longer expect that we're to be trusted simply because of our formal credentials. Indeed, we must once again prove that we are worthy of being entrusted to pursue discovery and push the boundaries of accepted knowledge with diligence and accuracy. And this is a moment that calls for openness and transparency as a way of burnishing trust with the broader public. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown the promise of such an approach, as well as in truth, some of its vulnerabilities. On the one hand, we've seen remarkable successes, the sharing of data in real time among researchers and the open publication of research results have accelerated our understanding of COVID-19 and its many variants and led to the rapid development of pathbreaking treatments in ways and at a pace that would have been unimaginable in years past. At Hopkins, we of course were proud, proud to play a role in the pandemic through the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, which has served as an indispensable repository to the public and policymakers of testing and tracking data and expert in a, interpretations of this uh, data. At the same time, however, the research enterprise has experienced a number of high profile setbacks during COVID where bad data or shoddy analysis were released to the world too quickly and fueled disinformation campaigns. For me, however, these are not reasons to close ourselves off from the public, but to embrace openness and visibility for all it has to offer for discovery and democracy, and to do so with guardrails that will help ensure that the data we produce and verify and the insights and recommendations we draw from the data remain a vital and reliable public resource. Finally, the last way in which colleges and universities serve democratic society is by acting as microcosms of pluralistic democracy that brings students into meaningful contact with peers whose backgrounds and beliefs differ from their own. A healthy democracy depends on the interaction, dialogue, and vigorous contestation of values and ideas across a vast spectrum of experiences to forge democratic compromise, consensus, and will. Yet today, citizens seem to be remarkably incapable of communicating across their differences. Evidence shows that people increasingly regard those with whom they disagree with distrust and see in those who hold opposing political views as being enemies whose ideas are not to be, whose ideas are to be feared in silence rather than fellow citizens whom they can engage and learn from. Take for example, the fact that in the last 50 years, the share of Republicans and Democrats who say they would be upset by one of their children marrying a member of the opposing political party has risen from about 5% for each party to more than 25% for Republicans and 20% for Democrats. Colleges and universities are among the institutions that have offered young people their first opportunity to leave their communities in which they grow up uh, which they grew up and to interact with others from different racial, religious, regional, socioeconomic, and political backgrounds. And over the last several decades, as American higher education has diversified, thanks to the bold advocacy of so many students, faculty, and leaders, and historic support from both government and philanthropy, our campuses are now more diverse than ever. And yet, and yet, for all that we have done for representation, I worry that we have not fully or adequately fostered in our students a capacity for exchanges across differences that are foundational to a healthy democracy. Many institutions, like mine, have allowed students to choose where they live, whom they live with, where they dine, and what classes they take. And we know from research that when given these choices, students will, uh, not surprisingly, most often choose to associate with people who look just like them. We have essentially given our students a pass to opt out of encounters with people who are dissimilar from themselves. And even when encounters across difference do occur, they're more likely to be superficial and fleeting, presenting little opportunity for self-reflection and reasonable substantive disagreement. At a moment when we're seeing the corrosive effects of polarization and hearing so much about the deleterious effects of cancel culture, whether such a culture is real or perceived, perhaps we should start not by pointing fingers, but by doing the work to ensure that our students first understand how to live alongside one another and to speak to one another about difficult issues in our society. 
To my mind, that means rethinking how we shape student life on our campuses to promote more sustained encounters between students with different backgrounds, perspectives, beliefs, or political viewpoints without, of course, sacrificing necessary opportunities for students to connect with peers who do share similar identities. One of the first steps I call for in my book is that universities should work harder at fostering a stronger culture of debate and dialogue on our campuses. Universities have become too reliant on single speakers or panels of speakers who are in broad agreement. Indeed, one study found that most universities only sponsor about one event per year about a public policy issue that deliberately structures different perspectives on the program. Now at Hopkins, we're in the process of launching an initiative that we will model precisely this kind of debate for our community. And we're hoping that it can set a standard and expectation of modes of interaction that are too infrequently manifested on our campuses. Committing ourselves to more disagreement in our public events is one way we can model for our community the art of debate and the importance of civic friendship. And we should do this in the pursuit of instilling in our campuses a more purposeful pluralism. I recognize that colleges and universities face many hurdles right now, uh, from financial hardship to the uncertainty caused by the pandemic, to governments, legislatures, and communities that are suspicious, if not outright hostile to the academic enterprise. And public universities, in particular, are more and more at the center of the political crosshairs. One US Senate candidate in Ohio, not North Carolina, thankfully, even delivered a speech recently titled, wait for it, universities are the enemy. Under such extraordinary pressures, it can feel like we always have to be, we are always on our heels playing defense, making it difficult to even imagine launching new initiatives to support democracy. Yet I believe sincerely and deeply, this is precisely what we need to do right now. And at the University of North Carolina, you're one of those institutions that I applaud for being at the forefront of these efforts. Your new program for public discourse is cultivating a culture of democratic debate and discourse on campus. Your faculty are studying the climate for free speech in your classrooms. Your award-winning Carolina Votes Initiative led to more than 82% of eligible students voting in 2020, up from 25% from in the previous election. That's just tremendous. And if you've written, and you have written democracy promotion into your university strategic plan, you are quite simply a model and an inspiration to other universities in this time of democratic need. From the earliest days of this country's history, universities have been called upon at moments of democratic fragility to step up. We're indispensable to the democratic project. And I believe now truly is our moment to renew and magnify that role in the months and years to come. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to meet with you all today and to share a few thoughts with you. And I really welcome the opportunity to hear your questions and thoughts uh, on what I really believe are a foundational set of issues for our institutions and in truth, our country. Thanks so much. Thank you, President Daniels. And uh, uh, I'm gonna, before I turn this over to uh, Professor Tori Ekstrom from our Huston School of Journalism and Media to uh, facilitate the questions uh, from the audience, uh, which I believe are being posted in the chat. Uh, I just wanna uh, kick it off. And, and first of all, thank you for a wonderful synopsis of um, uh, of your book uh, and the key takeaways that I know um, have left many academics uh, rethinking the, the role and responsibility of colleges and universities around uh, the country. Uh, and uh, so thank you for intriguing us. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the book and, and uh, you cited on a few occasions, Clark Kerr, who's someone that I have uh, referenced and cited in, in uh, classes that I teach here in, in the professoriate. And uh, I love his description of the university as an institution perpetually at war with itself. And, uh, you know, because it contains so many uh, contradictory opinions and goals. Um, so that seems true of democracy as well. And so I guess my question is, how do we keep that war of ideas uh, from becoming destructive? Uh, and what guardrails do we need? 
So I, um, you know, of course, that's really, you know, the, you know, the question for our institutions and for our democracy. And, um, and it's obviously not easily answered, but I think, I think fundamentally where we have to be completely um, firm and vigorous is in our defense of the primacy of our commitment to unfettered inquiry to fact and to principle and to this idea of open debate and contestation that that you know the, it seems to me that we've got to, every institution has to ask itself what makes itself what makes that institution um, distinctive and impactful and in case of universities i think it really always is about our commitments to unfettered debate and to these values of inquiry and truth seeking and so forth and so I think that although it's not always easy, and we know that there's so many times when we're going to be tested in these convictions, I think this is a moment in which we've got to continually make the case for why this institution matters, why we're a place apart, what we do uniquely for society, and an understanding that um, that even when there are moments of deep conflict and contestation on our campuses, in some sense, if we're doing our job, that's just as it should be. That's not a sign of our dysfunction. In some sense, it can be a sign of our, of our health and robustness that we are the place where you can have these kinds of interactions. So I, I, I think it constantly is back on us to, um, to, to, to make the case for what we're about, so that it's not just society that I'm that is sensitive and, uh, to this, but that our own constituents understand, you know, the um, obligations and the benefits of being part of this community and the really critical role that we play in stewarding democracy. Great, thank you. You you touched on. Uh, in chapter three, you, you talked about the reproducibility crisis and you, you uh, touched on it here in your, in your talk. And, uh, you know, one of your uh, quotes that you had there, I jotted down where you said that a leading journal editor had, had made this, this quote uh, that essentially said that science uh, is, a, um, is at a point where no one is incentivized to be right. Instead, scientists are incentivized to, to be productive all too often to be first. Um, and that is concerning. And I, uh, you know, I guess as university leaders, do, do we have to begin rethinking the, the reward system uh, for faculty? And, um, you know, how do we fix this? We sit at the AAU president's meetings and we hear these opinion polls, as you, you alluded to in your talk as well. And uh, uh, certainly I think our, um, we're moving in the right direction with what, because of the research throughout the COVID and, and the pandemic. But uh, we still have a long ways to go in terms of overall public opinion. So your thoughts about the reward system? So I, look, I think it's this this is among the issues that I that I think it behooves us to look at in an unflinching way. And you know, to the extent that um, we are contributing to this you know, rush to rush to publish in a way that increases the increases the likelihood that the findings are incorrect or incomplete, then we've got to own some of this and that we, you know, we do have an important role as gatekeepers. And the, again, the responsibility to create incentives that are really congruent with our core responsibilities, um, I think is, is something that's important for us to, um, to bear in mind. You know, we're not, we're not just, we're not just passive receptacles here. We have the ability, if we believe, for instance, that you know the um, that there are um, unwarranted incentives that are pushing in a different direction and shaping or perverting in some fundamental way the research enterprise, um, we can fix this. We can fix this at a you know at a, at a pan institutional level, but we can also um, have the courage of our convictions and fix this at at individual universities and to think about you know, whether there are ways in which we are sending signals, either deliberately or inadvertently, that are channeling particularly young colleagues in a direction 
that um, increases the likelihood of these failures. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Kevin. I think we've got to, we do have to, we do have to look closely at this. And, and as you know, part of the argument, at least for me, is thinking about ways in which we can move to um, putting more of our work in support of our findings into the public domain so that this, again, constitutes another way in which we can reassure the public and, um, and our peer community that there's a, there's a solid foundation for whatever findings we ultimately are advocating for in various scholarly journals and other fora. Great. I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Ekstrom. I know she's monitoring the, the questions that are coming in, but, and you touched a bit on this as well, but maybe I'm going to ask it from a slightly different perspective. But over the last few decades, uh, a college degree uh, has become a noticeable dividing line in American public life. Uh, when you uh, look at income, geography, and political attitudes across a, a range of issues, uh, college graduates increasingly look uh, like a separate uh, tribe, if you will. Uh, what can universities do? What should we be doing? Um, and what's the responsibility of our faculty and students in bridging that divide? So, I mean, this is really, I think, such a, an important question for us to be jointly addressing together. Uh, and it seems to me, at least a starting point, is first and foremost, as much progress as we've made in, um, in getting at issues of access to higher education, I think the reality is, as I've said before, it's not just in the United States, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's true throughout Western Europe, it was true in Canada, it's true in public universities, it's true in private universities, it's true in universities that have relatively low levels of tuition. We know that there's um, an inherent propensity of children of affluence to be disproportionately represented in our communities. And so it seems, it seems to me that um, here that you know, to the, ex to the extent that we can continue to do as so many of us are doing to make more and more inroads in trying to reduce the barriers to access um, for people of, who come from backgrounds where that there is no tr family tradition of going to university or there's substantial economic hardship, to the extent that we can show that more of those students more of those families see themselves in our institutions, I think it's at least one important way in which we start to um, attack this deep um, and growing level of cynicism about us. But I think, you know, again, to the extent that in the most cynical view that institutions um, are seen to be sites of unwarranted and ill-deserved perpetuate uh, perpetuation of intergenerational privilege to the extent that we're unresponsive to that and we don't do things differently to get at that. Um, I think we make ourselves vulnerable. So I, I really do think you wanna start with, you know, hitting people where they live and if they can't see a path for their children to make their way to our institutions, um, that's a real issue. And then I think, of course, there's a host of other ways in which we've got to uh, think in the way that I, I think your institution does so well, but ways in which we share the bounty of our intellectual resources with the communities of which we're part. Um, so that, again, people see they have a stake in our success. But, but again, I really do think it starts, it starts, it starts with enrollment and and despite all of our best efforts to uh, direct assets that we have in the university to the communities of which we're a part, if those communities don't see their kids as coming to our institutions um, and see that they're, you know, that the, that we are uh, just un, undeservedly preserving for ourselves the uh, the the bounty. I think we have a. I think we will continue to confront this uh, this this deep cynicism about us. Yeah. 
Thank you. Tori, do you want to take it? Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, let me um, uh, start and 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 uh, piggyback on that last comment, um, Prof uh, President Daniels, because of course you're a legal scholar as well. Um, and the question asker, um, Armando, is um, asking a similar question to what the chancellor just asked about. Um, and he writes, the Supreme Court, as you probably know, has agreed to hear arguments in a case that seeks to abolish the policy for um, minority excellence or minority um, admissions policies that universities have adopted. And um, that case obviously involves UNC um, and Harvard. And Armando City would like to hear thoughts about whether you agree with that this is a crucial policy, which I think you've already spoken to, um, to ensure diversity and representation in, in universities. Um, but he asks, do you believe that the court plays a role in the advancement um, or uh, in this discussion? Like besides, I suppose, the university role here, um, you know, what other institutions need to get involved? Or, I mean, obviously the court is getting involved, um, will be involved. And I think there'll be a lot of us obviously watching the outcome of that case. Um, what's your sense about other institutions role uh, in this discussion? So, um, look, I, I mean, I think the point is a, is a really important one. And that is to say that, um, you know, ultimately, uh, we're not the only actor that speaks on these issues around higher education. And we know that these are, you know, that issues around higher education policy implicate a, you know, a host of different actors. There's, there's media and highly polarized media, there's social media, uh, there's, there's the legislative branches of government, um, you know, at, at, at both state and federal levels. And then of course there's the judiciary. So, um, you know, that, and, and we know that the perspectives on the character of our enterprise and its congruence with the national interests will be the subject of debate um, and very different views across those institutions, even individuals within those institutions. And, and that can't help but affect our role. And clearly, you know, in the most uh, you know, extreme case that, you know, should we find a, a substantial revisitation of Bollinger and Bakke in terms of our ability to uh, think about the role for a holistic emissions process. Um, you know that is that that will have significant implications, and I believe dire implications on some outcomes here for how we um, discharge our 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 responsibility to democracy. So, well, what can you say in light of that? Other than you know, uh, it's important that. Um, we be in a position, I, I believe, to advocate in a, in, in a number of different public fora for what we, what we believe to be a principled approach to the responsibilities that we have to country and, um, and not in some sense to take the view that others will necessarily advocate for us or attend to our interests if we stand this out. Um, I think we're in a, I think we've done amazing things over the last several decades in American higher education. Our institutions are so much more interesting, so much more accessible, um, uh, so much more reflective, not perfectly by any means, but so much more reflective of the complexity of American society and getting us closer to, I believe, this, the honoring the principle of equal opportunity. That's a good story for us to be telling. And, um, and I think even, you know, um, and again, it's not always easy and, and it's easy for, it's easier for some institutions than others that, um, for instance, don't have to deal with the same levels of political oversight um, that other institutions do. Um, but, but those of us who are in a position to be able to argue for these issues and to argue for the university have to do so. Um, and, and, and again, um, I, 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 I think particularly given the complexity and dynamism of American society, 
if we don't, I, I, as I said before, I have no confidence that anyone else will do it well or do it at all for us. Right. I'll, I'll exercise the moderator's privilege here for a second and just um, make an attempt to represent the view I'm not as keen on in that case myself, which is essentially that um, right that merit should be the only determinant right for students who are applying to prestigious inter institutions like ours and to, to Johns Hopkins. Um, having just had my own daughter go through this process, um, I watched what is compared to 20, 30 years ago, right? This incredibly anxious system of application, right? Some of that is due to the, you know, applying process now, like you can apply, you know, at the click of a button. Um, some of it to the social media environment, right? But there is, when you see how hard our students work, right, there is some merit or some, not to, you know, make fun of this in any way, but there's some um, merit to the argument that merit matters, right? And so for the plaintiffs in the case, um, right, this is their, this is their concern. And so I just, I wonder how as educators, I mean, we can make the arguments that you've just um, talked about, but we, operate on a system of merit, right? We're always um, awarding, you know, grades, awarding various um, accolades. So it, I find that challenging sometimes to have that discussion in my own classroom. I think that's fair. I guess, you know, for me, um, and maybe this won't be satisfying to um, any, many people, any people, but, you know, for me, I still feel very comfortable and uh, thinking about what we are doing in terms of the way in which we conduct our admissions process and even um, you know, seeing it as a process that is pro producing a very diverse class as being scrupulously attentive to issues of merit. Like I, I truly don't believe that when, you know, when you're taking um, the views that we do of the re array of different types of achievement, um, even the arrays of different type of academic achievement that get attention or institutions and, 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 and incorporating that into the admissions process, I think you're honoring rather than uh, defiling principles of merit. So I, I, I feel, you know, I, I think we're, that's the space we're in. And again, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a story that we just, and an explanation that I think we need to um, tell more. I mean, I think sometimes this debate is just so distorted um, and so utterly um, misrepresented from the reality of what a lot of us are actually doing in our admissions programs and the kinds of things that, that we're taking into consideration and how we're doing it. And, and I, I really, I truly do feel this is not an assault on merit, but fidelity to it. I'm in agreement with you there in the, the spirit of our uh, program for public discourse, trying to present sort of Thank the, you. the opposing <laughs> view, right? Um, which is what we, I'm always trying to model in my classroom. Uh, I think we all try to model. Um, and so, okay, so let me get back to some of our question askers here. Um, my colleague Shannon McGregor is asking, you spoke about uh, universities instilling values and skills for students to be prepared to function as democratic citizens. Can you speak a little about the tensions between the need to instill those values and skills, often rooted in critical thinking and conceptual courses, and the increasing pressure on universities to instill graduates with the skills needed for a particular profession? It's um, it, it's a question that, as uh, as you know, we were we we discussed earlier today, and I think I mean that this tension, uh, of course, is there, but I actually think it's more easily accommodated than um, than a lot of people are acknowledging. So first and foremost, you know, for a lot of people, um, they a lot of our students, and quite understandably, maybe most of. Uh, our students are coming to the university with an expectation that this is in part this experience will give them a shot to a better life in terms of some higher level of material comfort um, for opportunities for 
um, all the things that I talked about before in terms of diminished risk of unemployment, increased life expectancy, all these personal benefits that derive from this experience and being ready for a economy in which we know the core storehouse of wealth is increasingly human capital like that. So we, so, so that's true. But I also think one that the kinds of things that we're talking about in terms of what makes for success in that, even in that very narrow view of what university is about, if we just take the view that we are just basically uh, job, we're just we're just basically doing uh, uh, education for uh, for the labor market, and that's just just about a combination of skills development and credentialing, so that so that people can then go and flourish in, in, in the labor market. Even if that were so, we took that very narrow conception of our role, I still think that, that the capacities that you talked about a moment ago, critical judgment, analytical capability, an ability to contextualize phenomena, to see, to see countervailing views, all the things that we traditionally associate with a liberal education, are all things that I think ultimately will enhance your capacity to compete effectively in that in that in that economic domain. So I, I don't I think in truth there's not a deep tension there. And I think in fact, again, as educators, it really behooves us, you know, as, as we try to do, but but again, we got to be able to persuade our students and their families that you know, taking that course in Western civilization or learning a second language or you know, reading great literature and developing critical skills, it turns out those are things that in the most narrow of terms, you're ultimately gonna be able to capitalize on and will make you more successful as an engineer, as a software developer, as, as a physician, you know, the list could go on and on. And then of course, is you know stepping outside of that is the argument that's not only what we're doing. So yes, we 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 can, we are doing we are doing skills development. We are we are enriching our students' uh, human capital and making them job ready. But it's so much more than that. We are we are giving them an education and the opportunities for uh, levels of personal fulfillment, enrichment, and just personal development that are of benefit to them beyond the ways in which you can capitalize on that in the marketplace. But also, as I said before, really do have important social benefits that help society overall. So I think all these arguments nicely align. And I know there's at times a skepticism, maybe even a cynicism about this, but look, you speak to so many graduates, I'm sure, you know, we all have had this experience where you go out to talk to graduates or come from our institutions. And it's amazing the number of people who have reached the highest echelons in their chosen uh, professional uh, business lives. And how often they will say the most influential course, and you're talking to someone who is an engineer or someone who got an MBA, and you think that they're gonna say corporate finance, or, you're gonna, or they're gonna talk about applied math and stats. And it turns out they say it was Cicero or it was flat. So I just, I think, I think that this is where uh, we have to understand our role is not just preparing our students for their first job, but for their fourth or fifth job and, and really giving them the capacity to be full citizens and full leaders. And that requires more than just narrow technical skill. Very good, very good. We have a question here from Meredith uh, and she asks, how can institutions safeguard professors to foster democratic discourse in light of the fears that can arise due to the power that can come from students taking to social media? And I might add, it's not just students, right? It's, it's all audiences um, where professors are getting targeted or social media in general acting as a targeting tool. How can we help professors not fear difficult conversations out of fears of losing tenure and negative PR. And I know this morning we talked a little bit about even students feeling that 
pressure in the classrooms and our own research here at UNC has shown that pressure to be the case. Social media has really introduced a very difficult. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's been both empowering for our students. So let me defend the medium since this is my area of, uh, this is my school, right? I mean, it's been empowering in many ways, but it has also introduced so many challenges to the process of um, getting an education and being, being an instructor, being a researcher. So again, I think it requires a few things. Um, one, I think it's just the scene setting. That is that right from our, the moment that students come to our institutions, uh, we have to explain to them in some sense, the rules and expectations and norms that govern our institutions and the sense that this, you know, this instinct to find some slight faux pas or some ambiguity to blow it up to get the gotcha moment. That's that's not learning. That's not education. And creating that kind of environment is really inimical to a success to, to success um in you know in a learning environment and i so I, I think in some sense it requires even before uh our students or others can indulge the instinct to do what so many are doing now in social media and they're you know well outside of the academic setting say this is this is not what we do here and and to make it clear that this these kinds of discussions this kind of debate um these kinds of challenges are what makes for a great learning environment, and and we've got and we've got to evolve, We've got to avoid the cascade of of you know, deleterious uh, consequences to 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 folks um, in the classroom, both students and faculty, who are just trying to work through and challenge issues and not necessarily accept whatever the received wisdom um, is at the moment. And so I think in part, it's trying to put that prophylaxis in place where if people have a clearer sense of what we're all about and what are the norms and what comes with the territory, um, then I, I think that that's a step in the right direction of resiliency. But then of course, at another level, and I hope, you know, as the tests have come to me personally, that I don't stumble on this, but when the tests do come, and you've got moments when um, when an individual student or faculty member um, is subject to one of these campaigns. Um, I think this is where it requires us to lean in and to be protective. Now, again, you know there may be some there may be some things that you you know that that you know, truly are indefensible. But it seems to me that there's a lot more conduct that when you see the reaction of our communities to uh, things that are provocative, sometimes been inaptly put, um, sometimes is innocent. But but when you see that, that the capacity of very intense reactions in those moments, I think that's where it actually requires leadership um to be able to say that wait a second you know we're we got to remember what we're about and wait a second you know not everything that someone says in a classroom and debate is perfectly framed and not as nuanced as we would like to be and we just can't indulge this instinct for essentially capital punishment for for even those moments that are inartful or inapt. And we've got it, we've just, in some sense, I think this is really about a plea for essentially just more tolerance of human frailty um, and, and, and to seeing that in, you know, in a number of different settings and that people are capable of being more complex and textured than one particular moment um, in one in which one thing was said in, you know, in a conversation that people took umbrage with. So I, I just, I think we've got to build those kind of buffers in. And again, I think it's linked to this broader idea of like, what makes us apart as an institution? What makes us separate as an institution is our, is our absolute determination to create an environment in where claims can be interrogated and contested 
and where people can say things that, that can, can put forward ideas that are that seem counterintuitive, but yet, as we've seen so many times through history, it's those people and those claims that very often turn out to be on the right side. So we've we've it's just it requires that kind of humility and willingness to accept this is all part of the of legitimate debate. Yes, in our school too, I think what we try to do is actually study the environment, right, as a way of also having a discussion about it and what it does well and what it doesn't do well, right, on social media. That's sort of one other, I think, strategy that those of us who study in the media try to try to shed light on. Um, but yes, we have a um, one of our trustees is with us today, um, Marty Kodis, and um, he asks, um, do you feel that universities embrace viewpoint diversity? And how welcome are conservative pers uh, perspectives? This has been a big conversation here on our campus um, in recent years. And um, so curious um, what your thoughts are about that. So, um, you know, I think we have to start with a frank recognition that if you look at the composition of our faculty, um, it, 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 it overwhelmingly leans uh, liberal in much of higher education. Um, There's some exceptions, but by and large, you know, that is, that is true. Um, I think it's also fair to say, and again, looked at, uh, look at the literature on this, I think that um, faculty by and large are moved by a professional sense of professional responsibility ethos that even if their politics take them in a certain direction, that we're in their teaching in certain domains, they understand the responsibility to be able to put a forward array of different views, even ones that they don't necessarily agree with, but in an effort to be, particularly in the basic courses where you really feel you're at an introductory level that you're exposing students for the first time to a rich array of ideas. And particularly, even if you lean lift in your politics, you understand the importance of, a, of the tradition of conservatism and the United States and being able to represent those ideas in a way that is faithful and sympathetic. Um, so I think, I, think we've, I think that we do that well, even though we do, uh, do um, uh, lean left. Having said all that, I am worried about the lack of conservative voices um, in the academy and people who are writing and thinking from a conservative perspective. And, you know, in fields, you think about whether it's um, philosophy, political science, sociology, I don't get quite as excited about this in, in more technical scientific fields. But in those areas, I think it's really important that we do have conservative scholars who are working from those traditions. And I think it's important one, for the academy itself, just for the richness of debate, that you do have these voices that are represented from people who are deeply committed to them and working to advance uh, the, um, the, the, the perspective and the worldview and doing so against high scholarly standards of the academy. I think that's, I think that's, a, I think that's important for, uh, for those of us who are on the other side of the political spectrum to confront those views and to be able to, to work with and be challenged by people who have different views. And that's a daily part of our, our interaction. I think that's important for the academy. And, and again, you know, inc you know, increasingly, um, I, I am talking to my colleagues as they think about hiring and the extent to which, as we have thought about in so many other parts of the university, you know, when 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 departments go to hire, they, you know, the Department of uh, Philosophy has an open position. They will have the debates about, you know, do we need do we need someone working from this uh, perspective? Are we, you know, are we in a continental tradition or an analytic tradition? Where, you know, there are all these debates about what we should put the thumb on the scales for at this point in time and sort of enriching the department. And I think in that context, it would be, um, it would be odd not to be thinking about whether we need to bolster this, the people working from, 
the conservative political perspectives who have, who, uh, you know, um, in, in key departments. I mean, I, I think it's a legitimate thing for our departments to be worried about in terms of the array of different perspectives and strengths that, that they have. Again, we do this routinely as we think about, um, we think about our, um, the strength of our departments. Let me finally say, I think an issue, again, um, uh, that I don't think we talk nearly enough about but I do worry, and this goes more broadly to the character of our country in this point in time and that instinct for um, deep polarization and polarization that of course is defined by um, geography as well as anything that we live and work with people who share our same views and not, not interacting with others. But I, I really do worry that um, not only is not having conservative scholars on our campuses bad for the rest of the, the campus who may not necessarily share those views. But I think this is really bad for conservatism in the United States in the sense that if conservative scholars don't end up in our universities, on our faculties, you know, they're going to do more of what's happening, which is they end up in think tanks in Washington, in other parts of the country where they're just speaking to themselves. And I think if we're trying to think about how we bring the country together, I think it's really important that those who are at the, who are at the frontiers of conservative, social, political, economic commentary be in a position where they have to defend their claims against people who have different perspectives than their own. And I think it'll make their work better. And I think also in some sense, try and pull the country back a bit so that we're seeing less extremism. Um, and yet if, if these folks only find themselves in think tanks outside of the university, um, I, think this is, I think this is really bad for them. So I think that's another dimension to this. And it's less about, the experience the students have, but more just recognizing the ways in which we interact with society at large and not having, not having this presence on our campus, I think contributes to the more general trends that we worry about in this country. Right, right. Um, along the lines of, of hiring, there is a, um, uh, you were talking about the philosophy department, there is a question here, um, and it, it, it dovetails more with our earlier discussion about DEI issues and, and the Supreme Court case. Um, the question asker, Ann York here asks, um, you know, about hiring um, uh, faculty of color. And so she writes, um, even before the Supreme Court rules on affirmative action in university admissions, many universities have already eliminated scholarships based on preferences for minorities. Um, she talks here about some um, statistics about UNC. Uh, we just learned that UNC awards the seventh largest number of doctoral degrees to black students in the country. That number is 141, an average of 28 a year. Our total doctoral degrees awarded average around 1,220 per year over that five-year period. So roughly 2.2% of our doctoral degrees are awarded to black students each year, while our state's black population represents nearly 22%. And these are our future professors, teachers, of our future students. What does that say to black students seeking higher education? What can we do about that? And presumably the answer here is, is about the hiring that we also try to work on and do, but don't seem to succeed. <laughs> I won't say more about that being at the Hussman School, but, <laughs> but it is, right, it's a challenge. So, you know, I, this is something that at, um, just in terms of, things that I have worked on and thought about at Hopkins, you know, we are um, at, you know, a school that leans to STEM in particular with a focus with uh, the biological sciences. And again, when one looks at the statistics in terms of minority students in PhD, STEM PhD programs, um, it doesn't look great. And the truth is, just, you know, this is uh, despite you know a number of different efforts over the years, 
um, the numbers just haven't uh, improved in the way one uh, would have expected. And, and look, this is, again, you know, as we think about the future of this country, you know, um, in particular, you know, in the STEM related fields, our huge dependence on, um, on, on foreign students uh, in our STEM PhD programs and our postdoctoral programs. And, and again, um, seeing that while some of these students stay, a lot of them have difficulty getting visas, ultimately return to their countries. You know, we're really compromising the capacity. Again, I'm talking about the sciences, but this is where the underrepresentation problem has been most acute. But we're compromising the future competitiveness of this country by not being able to figure out how we get clear pathways, pipelines of minority students into our PhD programs. And you know, here we're even seeing, you know, while we've started to see significant movement on the undergraduate side, it's not translating into, in terms of minority students in our undergraduate STEM related program, it's not translating into PhD programs. So I think this is a, a very, very serious issue that uh, quite apart from the moral imperative, there's just a straight competitiveness issue that we've got to worry about as a country uh, particularly, you know, just even given the vicissitudes of our relationship now with China. I mean, again, you know, we've worried too many times that the, you know, the ability of um, our, our institutions to count on these students coming into and populating our STEM PhD programs and our postdoctoral programs is highly vulnerable. So I, I think this is why we got to worry about this. And then worrying about this, I think, means, you um, Given the number of decades of efforts that have not resulted in movement, I think it means we've got to try new things and how we develop these pipelines. And you know, right now we're involved in a very um, significant effort where we basically have um, partnered with uh, several HBCUs and just saying, build our pipeline, build our pools. You know, again, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're we're going to stick to standard uh, metrics of merit and achievement and how we ultimately make admissions decision, but we got to populate these pools and find ways to persuade students who typically don't think about these STEM related PhD programs to treat this as a very um, intriguing opportunity for their uh, for their professional futures, and so I just think it means that we've got to do we have to do things with a degree of intentionality and experimentation in a way that um, that recognizes that um, we're just not making progress. And the t statistics that you shared before about UNC, I mean, again, if you know if, if, if you continue to confront the same problem with the same strategies and making no movement, then you know at some point you've got to you've got to think about doing something differently. And and again, that's that's right now what we're trying to do with 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 this new program. And and this is a related question from one of our students, Bridget, um, who um, also talks about these issues around diversity. Um, and inclusion. She writes, um, admitting more lower income students to enable social mobility and creating requirements around civic education to foster democracy are wonderful ideas that she would like to see. I think all of us would like to see, but of course they're gonna cost money. And as members of social science and humanities departments know university funds are hard to come by, especially in these departments that would be the home of such civic education requirements. And so her very hard big question, she describes it, um, is from the standpoint of serving democracy, how do you think about what parts of university budgets can be cut? Because presumably the money isn't just gonna come in, right, to fund this type of civic education, although maybe it will. We, of course, have our program for public uh, discourse that, that is funded. Um, what are universities paying for that are, that's not serving democracy that maybe should no longer be prioritized? I think those of us in the humanities and, and social sciences, sciences sometimes feel, you know, we've been making, right, we've been crying this, um, we've been talking about these issues for a while, and now that things are, seem more critical and are more critical at the national level, 
um, you know, we're wondering where our NIH is, where, where is, where are the funding for those of us who have been talking about these issues for some time? So, you know, um, look, it's, it's, at some point, budgets reflect your priorities and, um, and, and budgets have to be in service to academic priorities and shouldn't actually limit or define them. That is to say, you know, um, if this is really important and we feel this is compelling at this point in time, then um, one, I'm not entirely convinced that these are budgetary issues. I think, you know, going to a faculty member and saying, you've been doing this, you know, this course and, you know, this advanced seminar course, it's had, you know, X number of students, less than five for the last several years. We need you to come in and do this other, this is an important moment and part of the suite of courses we're gonna offer around democracy. So that's not, it's a shift. It's a, you know, you need to support that colleague because they shift into a new course and, and have to develop, uh, um, you know, materials and so forth, but that not is not necessarily an on budget expenditure. So I think there's lots of, if it's important to us, we'll figure out a way in terms of how we reallocate our, our existing, your faculty time and energy. But I think more fundamentally, um, I, I, I would say that if it turns out that this is a budget issue, then, you know, we, we just, we just it, I don't think it's a huge number that's faulted. I really don't think that's a primary constraint, but we just have to find a way to do it. And I think ultimately, this is something where, I think particularly among our alumni, there's a growing sense of peril in this country. And that if we can make the case to them that this is something we believe we can do better to ameliorate this particular issue, I'd like to think that there's the opportunity to secure additional resources. I mean, there's a lot right now, um, particularly since January 6th, there's just so much activity by various foundations and others thinking about how we respond to this moment, and particularly the opportunities for civic education, not just in universities, but in K-12 education. And so again, I think um, what's really needed are you know, good ideas and a willingness of universities to experiment and to meet this moment. And I think if we show that, I'm less worried about the resource issues. I think they really are second order, if it, if if it, even that. Right. Well, we have we have one last question here. Um, uh, I mean, there are several more that we're not unfortunately going to be able to get to, but I do want to give the last question to one of our Royster fellows since we are one of the sponsors today. And and Ashka is asking um, when and how can universities take public opinions on issues that are empirically proven, but politically contentious, for instance, climate change, how can we, you know, help the public to understand what is actually fact, right? And would doing so benefit or harm these broader efforts to promote democracy? It's, it's it, look, it's, it's such, it's such an important and fundamental question. And look, there is, um, uh, you know, a very large literature as to how one thinks about the role of the university in trying to draw upon facts and data and principle to be able to break through these debates. And the truth is, um, and again, just all the, all the reasons we know in terms of um, uh, motivated reasoning and framing effects and so forth, there's lots of barriers that stand in the way of just facts alone being able to penetrate um, critics or skeptics on the opposite side. So I think that at one level we have to recognize um, we can't do it all. We still have a responsibility to be the place that produces and does the produces fact, uh, data, compelling, well-substantiated arguments. And, and, and that's what we need to do really well. And then thinking about the ways in which we can interact with other actors, institutions, and society that can use our work to be able to find ways to be able to get to the skeptic. So for instance, there's a large body of literature that shows that, that um, and in fact, a lot of the interesting work has been done around issues around climate change and skepticism of climate change. 
um, you know, bearing people with data um, who are skeptical of this doesn't seem to work alone. But if you can find ways, for instance, of getting some um, someone who has standing as um, an almost an, um, a, you know, someone who's who's got who's seemingly credible to that community um, has some level of authority legitimacy with them who can be able to play a role in being um, an interpreter a validator of the data starts to move people and so it may be that we're not a one size we're not a one stop we're not a one stop solution for every part of this but it seems to me if we get the if we do a good job on to the best of our ability ensuring that we got the facts right that we are you know appropriately explaining the strengths and limitations of our findings not overstating them providing that in a way that's accessible and then trying to figure out how we develop partnerships collaborations with others who may be more effective in being able to carry that data and findings into communities that are skeptical, maybe that's a winning combination. It may not be all on us, but but we can do our part. So I think we have to I think we have to be open to more of those kinds of partnerships and collaborations that bring some strange bedfellows together, but that will allow us to be able to get at some of this. You know, again, going back to um, our experience with the COVID tracker. Um, you know, it was really interesting that um, although there's so many parts of this pandemic where we've seen a high degree of contestation, what is the right thing to do in terms of masking, lockdowns, you know, for what period, um, how, you know, what, what are the rights, you know, what are the right um, uh, role, what is the appropriate role for employers and mandates, like all of this is highly contestable, but it was really interesting that in terms of a wide for array of different institutions, um, just basically saying, give us just the facts on the rates of infection, the rates of mortality, that we were able to do that and then to broaden out and using that as sort of the honeypot where we could provide other kinds of slices on aspects of the pandemic, the effect, the disparate impact on racialized minorities, um, to look at different rates of vaccination, to think about the role of different um, state policies and how that impacted uh, health, so that we were able to broaden out, but still kind of sticking, staying in our lane in terms of providing foundational data and then allowing others to use that in their own sort of interpretation analysis of this. And, and, and I think, I think again, given the power of big data and a lot of what's going on in our institutions in terms of the kinds of insight that we can bring to bear on a lot of different social phenomena, I think there's, I think there's more of that we can be doing across an array of different issues that locate the university centrally as a hope, credible, neutral repository of facts and expertise that can help break social log jams. I think that's a fabulous way to wrap up and to think about all the your book, President Daniels, and also this conversation today. Um, on behalf of all the Royster Fellows and our co-sponsors, we really want to thank you for spending time with us today, um, sharing your thoughts and answering our questions. We really do hope we can host you in person. I know that that invitation is open and continue this kind of conversation between um, what is right the oldest public research institution and the oldest private research institution, as I understand it, um, that Johns Hopkins is. So thank you. And thanks to Laura and Rachel today for helping things go smoothly. We really appreciate that. Um, we welcome feedback on this sec uh, session. I think Laura is putting a poll up for those of you who are still with us. We welcome feedback, please. Um, and have a good afternoon, everyone, under the sunny skies that remain. The Carolina blue is a little less blue today, but enjoy the rest of the day. And thank you again, President Daniels. My privilege. Thank you so much for the great opportunity.